Um, thank you, Marion, for the introduction, and thank you for coming to the early session, and we welcome our special guest here, the unicorn. Um, so I'm Yomna from University of Stuttgart, from the HCI lab, and I'm in my final year for a PhD under supervision of Albert Schmidt. Um, and today I'm honored to present to you <clears throat> our work on behalf of my co-authors, um, the paper Stay Cool, Understanding Thermal Attacks um, on Mobile-Based Youth Authentication. <clears throat> Um, so my co-authors are Stefan from University of Stuttgart and soon to be University of Essen, uh, Mohammed and Florian from LMU, University of Munich. Um, so basically now our phones has tons of content that's really sensitive, like you have your banking app that has like the bank account information and the account uh, details and stuff. You have your emails, you have your Dropbox, which has like the unpublished papers, which for at least for me it's more important than bank accounts. And like what we usually do, we try to protect this kind of information by using like authentication schemes. Um, like there is tons of them, but the basic stuff or like the most typical ones are using pins and lock patterns. And usually when we are like sitting alone in our kitchen or something, when we authenticate, we think it's perfectly safe just to put the pin or like the lock pattern and it's perfectly safe. However, think again, or at least when I'm around. Because as you can see here in the video, So this is Joshua, my friend, he's sitting in the kitchen, he unlocks his phone, and then he leaves the phone outside, he goes grab some water, and I came in into the room with a thermal camera, I captured the screen of the phone, and ta-da, I can actually reveal his pin entry. Um, so to understand how this works, or in other words, why thermal cameras can actually reveal such information, it's basically whenever there is two objects in contact, there is heat transfer at this um, contact point, um, and of course it relies on the material and it relies um, on the properties of the surfaces and the, the touching thing. So in our case we had the skin, so like the finger touching the screen, um, and we investigated this uh, thermal property, which is thermal conductivity, which actually reveals how much of heat transfer is uh, transferred at point of contact. Um, so basically we investigated the properties of the skin, the properties of the gorilla glass, and the reason we chose gorilla glass because this is the standard um, glass used um, in, in like developing touch screens. And what we found is when, when we touch the screen uh, with our body temperature like 30 degrees and the screen temperature of 23, there is heat transfer of 2.9 degrees, which actually causes the heat trace you can see in the images. And based on this, we can actually infer the pins and patterns that's entered by the user even after entering it, because the heat trace actually takes time to decay. Um, additionally, one interesting thing about thermal imaging and how it operates, it does not only provide you with a visualization for the heat or for the field of view of the camera, but also gets you temperature information so we can know where the user have pressed and the order of pressing. Um, of course, there has been tons of attacks, like the typical one or like the most known one with shoulder surfing, where basically you're entering the pin and someone standing next to you and trying like, to have a sneak peek on your phone. Um, other attacks, like the smudge attacks, which basically relies on the residues and the oil residues you leave behind after authenticating. Um, and these are quite explored in the community and there has been a um, lot of work there in the literature. However, with thermal attacks, it's considered relatively underexplored. So in this work, we're actually exploring how significant this attack is and, and how feasible and how viable it is as an attack. So what makes it a really significant attack is we can do the attack after authentication. So as you have seen in the video, we actually attack the phone after you place it. So you authenticate, you leave the phone, and then you leave. So you don't have to be physically there. Unlike, for instance, shoulder surfing, you have to be there when the user is authenticating. One other thing, we can have information about the order because like smudge attack, at least for the pin case, you can see where the user has pressed, but you cannot actually tell which pin was uh, entered first. But with the thermal attacks, you can actually know the order of entry. Last but not least, um, thermal cameras were actually considered kind of a fancy tool or like an expensive tool, but now it's, it's really becoming affordable in terms of cost and size. Um, so now you can get a thermal camera for, under, for hundred, like 300 euros or even um, less, and you can actually have it as an accessory in the phone. So basically you plug it to your phone and then ta-da, you have a thermal camera in your phone. Um, so, so far, um, it's a significant attack because of what we just mentioned. You can, um, uh, and actually what we found is, and this will be discussed later, even if you try to attack after 30 seconds, you can get up to 100% of recognition accuracy for the patterns. 
So what we wanted to do is, or what brings us to the main question is, okay, it's a significant attack, but how feasible it is and how effective and how viable it is as an attack. Um, so in order to uh, investigate this, um, we build a system because basically if you use our eyes, you cannot really tell the slight difference in temperature, so you cannot really tell the order. So what we did is we automate this process. We build a, a thermal analyzer, uh, which basically takes as an input a single frame from the thermal camera, and it can actually automate it, automatically get the pins and, and the lock patterns. And before getting into details, we have um, our code as open source. It's written in C++, based on OpenCV. It's on GitHub. You can uh, feel free to scan the code and download the code. We have all the data, data, like the images from the study, uploaded. So feel free to like download the data and play around with it. So that brings me back to how the system actually works. So basically, what we do is we take um, a frame from the thermal camera, which basically have as a field of view the the phone. And then, since the thermal camera actually captures quite like wide range of temperature, what we do is we like uh, limit this range to have a high contrast for the pins and the background, which is the phone. Additionally, we do some noise filtering and background subtraction, and then we end up with only like the entry or like where the user has pressed. And we do contour fitting like circular for the pins, lines for the patterns, and then this is like for the visual part. Additionally, we use the temperature information in order to to sort them. Um, to know uh, which pin was entered first. And, and based on the temperature information distribution, we can actually know if there is a pin that has been pressed twice or if it has been like pressed uh, the first entry or the last entry um, based on the temperature distribution. Um, and we use this system to actually evaluate um, how feasible and how effective and how like the success rate of thermal attacks um, so we conducted a user study, and with this, I hand over to Mohammed, who's going to explain how we conducted our user study. Thank you, Yomna. All right, so to understand the viability of thermal attacks on mobile devices, we conducted a user study in which we asked people to enter pins and patterns on their mobile phones. So um, as soon as they enter a pin or a pattern, they had to immediately place their phone uh, in this place mark that you can see on the screen. And that's right in front of the thermal camera, which takes uh, pictures uh, or thermal images um, at different timestamps. We investigated uh, the effect of two independent variables on the effectiveness of thermal attacks. So one thing is the property of the password. So for pins and patterns, we investigated which properties of pins and patterns can make them more resilient to uh, thermal attacks. And we also investigated the effect of the age of the heat trace. So as Yomna said, the heat, tra the heat traces decay over time. And we wanted to see to what extent can we still perform thermal attacks after authentication has been performed. And to really understand how well this works, we measured the success rate, which basically tells us uh, how successful is the thermal attacks in, um, in uncovering the pin or the pattern. Uh, we also did some more measurements uh, that we report in the paper, but here we'll focus on the success rate. So if we say that we have a success rate of 50%, for example, this means that 50% of the pins or the patterns were were successfully found uh, using thermal attacks. Okay, so the first variable in the study was the property of the password. So for the PIN, we thought about investigating the effect of having duplicate digits in the PIN. So if you, look, if you, if you take a look at um, this image in the middle, for example, it's really difficult to know the, with the naked eye whether the digit in the middle was pressed, was touched once or twice, or whether it's the last one. But we were wanted to see actually, because basically if you, if you touch a digit twice, you distort the heat traces. So we wanted to see if this actually makes thermal attacks harder to perform or easier. And um, for the luck patterns, we investigated the effect of uh, having uh, overlaps. So an overlap is basically when your finger swipes over a node that was previously selected. So uh, here's an example of some overlaps in these uh, pictures. As for the heat traces, um, so as you can see in these images here, uh, in these three samples, the heat traces actually decay over time, and as they decay, it becomes harder to perform a thermal attack. Um, we wanted to see for how long can we perform thermal attacks after um, authentication has been performed. So we investigated these uh, five um, timestamps. Uh, so these three that you see in, uh, on the right and also two, ad uh, two additional ones. So this means that we recorded a thermal image immediately after authentication, 15 seconds after authentication, 30 seconds, and so on. 
All right, so we use the uh, Optris uh, thermal camera. Um, you can see the apparatus here. And each participant had to enter three pins and three patterns. The order of entry was counterbalanced uh, using a Latin square. We had 18 participants, 10 females, and they all entered the passwords using, using their dominant hand. Okay, so what did we find out? So actually it turns out that the, the number of duplicates in the pin has a significant effect on the, uh, the success of thermal attacks. Actually it turned out that the more duplicates you have, the easier it is to perform a thermal attack. So it turns out that the image uh, processing approach that um, uh, Yomna described is really good at finding um, whether a digit was touched once or twice or three times. And it's also really good in telling you which digit was mentioned, was, was touched the last one. So by knowing these two pieces of information, it's pretty straightforward to, um, to come up with two or three guesses for the pin, and then you're 100% sure that the pin is one of them. So actually, for, in the case of having two duplicates, we achieved 100% accuracy, so all of the, of the pins with, um, that have two duplicates were, were successfully uncovered using a thermal attack. Uh, that was done uh, when the thermal attack was right after authentication and 15 seconds after authentication. Um, for uh, when you have only one duplicate, actually the success rate is also high, so in the first 30 seconds it's between 70 and, and uh, 83%. And when you have no duplicates, it's still also very high, so between 70 and 80%. So actually from that we conclude that um, duplicates actually make pins less secure against um, thermal attacks. As for the lock patterns, uh, as I said earlier, we investigated the effect of having overlaps. So actually here we found that having overlaps significantly increases the resistance to thermal attacks. So if you want to protect your, your lock pattern from thermal attacks, you need to have one overlap at least. So you can see here that the success rate is very low when you have two overlaps. It's a little bit higher if you have uh, one overlap. And in the case of not having any overlap, it's actually pretty easy. So like 100% of the uh, patterns were, were found within 30 seconds. As for the age of the heat trace, so if you perform the attack immediately after authentication, you get very high success rates. Um, and it remains pretty high until 30 seconds after authentication. So 30 seconds after, after authentication is still between 70% and 90%. Um, it gets lower as you, uh, as, you leave the heat trace, uh, as you leave the phone longer. So in 45 and 60 seconds, it's actually pretty low. And same goes for lock patterns that do not have any overlaps. So actually recovery is like 100%. So actually all of the lock patterns that don't have overlaps were successfully recovered using uh, thermal attacks. Um, however, they also, um, the, the, the accuracy or the success rate decreases uh, after um, 30 seconds. And as I said earlier, having a single overlap really complicates thermal attacks. Okay, so now we spoke about the threat and the, um, like we showed that actually it's, we, it yields high uh, success rates. Now, how can we protect ourselves from thermal attacks? So for when it comes to pins, uh, our recommendation is to use longer pins. So if you have longer pins, basically there is a higher chance that the heat traces will decay by the time a thermal attack is taken. Um, in case of patterns, try to have at least one overlap. It significantly increases the resistance to thermal attacks. And in addition, we thought about some protection measures that we refer to as physical protection measures. So basically, if you increase the brightness of the screen or if you uh, load a task that increases the CPU usage, you essentially heat up the phone and this erases any heat traces out there. One easy workaround is also to do some random swipes on the phone and this will distort the heat traces and make it harder to perform thermal attacks. All right, so that was also um, main, the main messages from this talk. So thermal attacks are uh, actually a threat to user authentication. Pins and lock patterns are vulnerable even 30 seconds after authentication. Uh, our recommendation is to use either longer pins or to use uh, patterns that, um, that have overlaps. Um, as Yomna said, the source code is available online and we encourage you to install, to download the code and to experiment with thermal attacks because it will be really interesting to see if the existing methods that were developed to resist smudge attacks and shoulder surfing attacks, it would be really nice to see if these methods also resist thermal attacks as well. Thank you very much, and we're looking forward to your questions. Hi, uh, I'm Nata from Syracuse University. Uh, I have two questions. Uh, but actually, first, I wanted to congratulate for the work. Very nice proof of concept. Uh, I can think of two uh, things to do, like next, uh, and those are like my two questions. My first question is. 
How realistic uh, do you think the study was in terms of like you had the phone on the table and users perform only the password, right? They didn't browse like social media or things like that. How do you think that could add noise to your algorithm uh, or, or something like that? Uh, yeah, so of course if you perform some interactions on the phone after authenticating, uh, this will could have a chance to um, reduce the effectiveness of thermal attacks. Um, so in the, in the threat model, we assume best case scenario for the attacker, and we assume that the user is, for example, checking calendar entries or uh, e uh, just taking a look at an email or so. However, we think it's also possible to, uh, it should be pretty straightforward to, to kind of um, separate the interactions and you know, try to um, focus only on the interactions that, are, that happen during authentication. However, we haven't done this yet, so this is something we plan to do in future work. Cool. Um, the second question is like, is it possible only by increasing the thermal camera resolution to maybe do like a, a mass attack? Like say people, like four people in a room, you could, you could do something like that or you think that that would not be something feasible based on the technology of the thermal cameras today? So you mean if we have a, a, a thermal camera with a yeah, a meeting room, resolution? For example, like a meeting room with a camera on the top ah. and kind of like okay. seeing what people are doing. Um, maybe that. Okay, so this is actually relies on the on the not the sense the thermal sensitivity, but the optical resolution of the camera yeah. you're using. Uh, what we use is this kind of a high-end thermal camera, and you can actually put it like one meter high, and you can still see like multiple phones. We didn't try it out, but like during the study, we had multiple phones, um, and you can actually still see the traces. We didn't actually test because of the occlusion mm. and stuff, yeah. but technically speaking, it's quite yeah. feasible. Yes. Cool. Yeah. Very nice first step. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you. Hi, my name is Leah, and I'm from Washington State University. Uh, I enjoy this one because I, I feel like this is something that you could do, no one would notice necessarily, but I don't know about people leaving their phone just sitting right after a lock screen, um, but do you think that this is a possible attack for collecting people's PIN codes and they're at the supermarket and they press in their PIN code and then you're the next person in line? and then you can get their code. But that's not necessarily Gorilla Glass. Do you know if that would work as well um, in this sort of attack? So the initial work on thermal attacks was actually on the pin, on the pad of the ATM. And it was actually like in the back days, it was in plastic and thermal attacks was really like um, efficient there. And now if you notice actually all the pin pads in the supermarket in metal, and it has really low thermal conductivity. So you cannot actually mm -hmm. perform thermal attacks on this kind of material. But if it's a different material, or even if you put like kind of uh, plastic on it, then it's feasible, yes. Hello, my name is uh, Julien Gorit from Telecom Paris Tech. So, good talk. Thanks. So my question is, um, so you, you give us the, the success rate of a thermal attack, but it's your thermal attack. So someone can always devise a better thermal attack. So meaning the results that hold now for uh, maybe will not hold for with someone else's formal attack. So my question is, do you have any theoretical result, I would say, that guarantee that some technique of locking will not be formal attackable by any any other formal attack, right? Because this, this attack depends on how you implemented your algorithm, basically. So if someone implements it in a different way, maybe it will be more effective. Um, so I think that there has been uh, some work about authentication using different modalities. So authentication using eye gaze and uh, like combinations of gaze input and touch input. There's also some work about like haptic cues that you, your password would depend on that on the, on the haptic cues that you feel. So whenever you introduce randomness, of course, thermal attacks they basically only target the touch screen. So if once you rely on a cue other than the touch screen, uh, thermal attacks shouldn't be possible. Did this answer your question? Uh, so I think your question was about the algorithm, like uh, the Yes, it was more about the algorithm because a different implementation of a thermal attack can have a different result on the success rate. Or yeah, exactly.